Hi, it's Victor Kim, and welcome to our midweek meditation. It's Holy Week, Wednesday of Holy Week. We're only a few days away from Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that, that wonderful proclamation of Christian hope and Christian faith and Christian promise. Uh, Easter Sunday is always such a, such a wonderful Sunday, but it's also a very peculiar Sunday, if you think about it. On Easter Sunday, billions of people around this world will attend a church service. They will be greeted with the words, Christ is risen, and they will respond with the words, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. What an odd claim, isn't it? I mean, this isn't something that you hear every day, that someone is risen from the dead. And yet that's what we claim at Easter. And I wonder sometimes, what do we believe about what we say? What do we believe about what we say? You know, the Apostle Paul, writing in the years after Jesus, wrote to a church in a place called Corinth. And they were struggling with some things there. And, and, and Paul writes to them, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead, right? The, Paul poses this question to this community at Corinth, and his question addresses a major point of division within the church at Corinth. But we know that it's a question that, that isn't limited only to this church at Corinth 2,000 years ago. The resurrection of the body, bodily resurrection, is a key claim of our Christian faith. But it hasn't been without its critics, both from outside the faith and even from within the faith. You know, there are those outside the faith, atheists and others, who would claim, look, dead people just don't live again, all right? We're just organisms. We're just biological organisms. We're just created from stuff. And when we die, we just become stuff again, right? We have conscious life, but only for a time. Our souls, the things that we consider to be our souls, well, they're just a function of our DNA. It's just the way that our brains are wired to work. While we're alive biologically, we think we have these spirits, we think we have these souls, but when we're dead, that's it, it's all over. But there are also those, there are also those from when, within the faith for whom the resurrection of the body is a really hard thing, even embarrassing thing to talk about. I mean, we're all supposed to be enlightened, reasonable, rational human beings endowed by our creator with brains with which to think, right? And doesn't there have to come a time when, when enlightened human beings evolved to the point of reasonability and rationality? Don't we have to reach the inescapable conclusion that the dead don't rise, not physically? Don't we have to come to that conclusion? I mean, lots of Christians, I think, are embarrassed to talk about a physical resurrection. I mean, after all, when's the last time you saw someone rise from the dead? I haven't, have you? You don't see a lot of resurrection these days. Not at all. And with the exception of times like Easter or maybe at funerals, we don't really hear much about resurrection either. If we do, sometimes the language of resurrection is couched in this idea of human potential or enlightened knowledge, right? Some modern people point to these scriptural accounts of the resurrection as just a way for early followers of Jesus in their pre-scientific minds to articulate and put into words something of the hope that they held in this person called Jesus of Nazareth. What he inspired in them, what he stirred and activated in, in them was, was this hope, this vision for a better world, a heavenly kingdom where justice and mercy, kindness and love, where grace would rule and fear would be banished, where life could be lived out in the fullness of God's intention for it. And, and Jesus embodied all these hopes. And even though he died, what he embodied, well, it lived on, lived on in the hearts and minds, in the words and actions of his followers, of his disciples, some of whom even claimed that, that Jesus had physically risen from the dead. But, but the learned ones, right? the intelligent ones, those who knew the science of their day, those who read the philosophy of their time, well, they knew better. They knew that if there was a resurrection, it would have been a resurrection of the spirit, a resurrection of the mind, but certainly not of the body. 
I mean, it's a metaphor. This idea of resurrection is a metaphor for the wonderful change that God can work in the lives of those who profess knowledge of this truth, right? This metaphor of resurrection speaks to the power of change, to the possibility of change. But, but those who know that also know that, that corpses, corpses don't get, resurrect, get, don't get resurrected. The dead don't rise. Those who argued against the, the, the rising of the dead in Corinth, they might have said things like, well, you know, the soul, the soul is immortal, that once we died, our souls would go to God, but, but not the body. And, and you might think, well, what's wrong with that? What's so wrong with that? Why isn't it enough to believe that our spirits, our spirits are immortal and that our rotting bodies are just that? They're just rotting bodies, right? That from dust we've come and to dust we're going to return. And yet, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul rails against. This is what he's at pains to oppose. If there is no resurrection, says Paul, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamations have been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, says Paul, we are of all people most to be pitied. I mean, why is this so crucial? Why is this so important to Paul? And why should it be so crucial for us? What's wrong with those who say that resurrection is just a, an existential thing, right? That if you believe that Jesus rose and it changes you in that belief, what difference does it make whether it actually happened or not? The power to change. The power is in the change that it makes in you. Isn't that enough? Is it enough? You see, Jesus died for a reason. Jesus died for a reason. And it wasn't to be our inspiration. It wasn't so that we would admire him as a good, godly man. It wasn't to set an example for us to follow in the kind of lives that we might lead, to fully utilize the potential that God has placed in each human being. I mean, Jesus is different from Gandhi. He's not the same as Martin Luther King Jr. He's not an equivalent to Nelson Mandela or to Mother Teresa or any other human saint in history. Jesus didn't die for any other reason but this, to be our savior, to be our redeemer. The Easter claim that Jesus is risen, that he is resurrected in body, that Easter claim is made because it's not enough to be just an inspirational corpse. They have no power to save, right? It's not enough to be an inspirational corpse. They have no power to save. And it misses the essential point of Christian belief, the essential claim of the gospel. You see, the problem isn't that we are just unactivated masses of potential, just waiting for someone to trigger all that possibility, right? The problem, the core problem, is that we are estranged from God. We're separated from God, that, that sin has broken our connection to our creator, that our relationship with God is in, is in a state of disrepair. So Jesus doesn't trigger the potential in us for good. Jesus in his death, but more than that, in his resurrection, in his bodily resurrection, becomes the means of our redemption, of our reconciliation, of our restoration in his resurrection from the dead, in his bodily victory over that which seems so final, our physical death, Jesus becomes our salvation. It's not symbolic, it's real. It's not a metaphor, it's actual. The temptation we face to be Gnostic is really, really strong, right? To see the spiritual and the physical as two different things, which is what Gnosticism says. To see the body and the soul as being separate, it's tempting to see the spirit and the soul as that which is pure, that which returns to God, which is separate from the body, which is often so frail and easily defiled and corruptible. But my friends, the resurrection 
the bodily resurrection of Jesus affirms the body, affirms that what we do matters, even more than what we might have been led to believe, right? The bodily resurrection affirms that the embodied life, the embodied life is meaningful, that Jesus embodied life. His incarnation was to become a physical human being, one of us. That's meaningful, not a distraction. That's meaningful. The resurrection from the dead affirms God's creation, affirms that what we do, what you and I do here in this life with these bodies as frail and as easily defiled and corruptible as they may be, that what we do with our bodies matter. Jesus took on human flesh, became one of us because it matters. And that in his resurrection from the dead, death is vanquished, not only symbolically, but literally, eternally, finally. In our church, where differences still linger about many, many things, some of them significant, still, at our core, at our core, we are united in the hope of resurrection through Jesus Christ. We are united in the hope to resurrection through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that points to our very humanity. To quote one theologian, not to know and trust Christ risen from the dead means finally not to be human. For it means really that there is nothing and no one beyond this world to whom we owe our being. My friends, the Easter claim is different. The Easter claim is different. It is more hopeful. It is the claim of resurrection, of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. It is to him we owe our being. And it is in him that we have been redeemed, that we have been renewed. It is in him that we are loved. And my friends, that is good news. Very good news indeed. Thanks be to God for that. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I want you now to listen uh, to a beautiful piece that Jenny has prepared for us. And this piece is a request from Dr. Charles Yang, a long time member of our congregation here at Richmond Presbyterian Church. It's a piece that was very, very meaningful to Dr. Yang and especially to his wife. And so I want you to take, uh, I want you to just enjoy this piece and listen. I wish you a, a wonderful Holy Week. We hope to see you at our Monday Thursday service tomorrow night, our Good Friday cantata service on Friday morning, and we hope to see you all at church on Easter Sunday. God bless.